Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Five by Age Five, Preparing for Children, Preparing Children for Success. I want to start by thanking everybody for spending um, the next hour with us learning about this topic and hearing from our guests. And as we begin, I want to acknowledge that County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a collaboration between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. My name is Ali Havrilla, and I'm joined by a team of colleagues and guests this afternoon. I'm a community coach with County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. Um, so is Tony Lewis, who will be with us to answer questions and monitor our chat. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Next, um, I'm privileged to introduce Tina Mosley, who is the owner and director of our Daycare and Learning Center. Good afternoon, everyone. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, Mike Sorth with the Collective Impact Network. Hello, thanks for having us. So just to share a little bit more about Mike and Tina, they are members of the 241 community in Missouri, which was recognized as a RWJF Culture of Health Prize community in 2016. The 241 is a unique collaboration that brings together 24 municipalities and many partners to take action, improving health outcomes and increasing equity throughout the community. I'm excited that they'll have the opportunity to share their story with us today. Uh, and as we begin, I'm going to now turn it over to Tony, who's going to share a little bit more about how you can be an active participant with us in today's webinar. Thanks, Sally. So if you joined us a few minutes early, you would have seen the wonderful video introduction. But in case you're joining just now, I'm going to do a quick overview on how you can partic participate further in today's webinar. If you have a question for our panelists, simply click on the Q&A control. When you do, the Q&A box will open up. Then you can type your question here. Then click send to submit your question and please send your questions in at any time. If you wanna share an idea with all of the attendees, use the chat to make comments or to respond to questions that we may ask you during today's webinar. To use the chat feature, click on the chat control and the chat box will open up. Then type your comment here. And then press enter to submit your response. You will have an option here to chat with all the attendees or the panelists only. We ask that you're comfortable. If you're comfortable and you want to share with all the attendees, that would be great. Um, because other participants can see your ideas and see what you're sharing. So now I'll turn it back to Allie to go over the learning objectives for today. If your eyes were quick, were quick you got a little sneak peek there. I jumped ahead. <laughs> um, so we've identified three learning outcomes that we hope you uh, walk away with today. The first is to understand one example of a community's journey to improving health outcomes and increasing health equity. And that community, again, is the 24-1 community in Missouri. Uh, second, we're hoping that you uh, learn a little bit about county health rankings and roadmaps and how you can access data, evidence, and guidance to support your local change efforts. Um, I'll note that we're not doing a full 101, but if you are interested in our County Health Rankings and Roadmaps 101, that is archived on our website. And finally, um, this, this third uh, learning outcome for today is an acknowledgement of the time we'll spend together towards the end, hearing uh, what questions you have about um, preparing children for success and hearing a little bit more from our guests digging deeper into their work. So I wanted to get started with uh, the why behind what County Health Rankings and Roadmaps does and why we exist. Uh, why do we produce the tools and resources that we do to support communities? And really, County Health Rankings and Roadmaps has two primary overarching goals. The first is to improve health outcomes for all. This includes both how long people live and how healthy they are. Our second goal is to close the health gaps between those with the most and least opportunities for good health. Another way you can think about this is um, increasing health equity. And we believe that everyone should have a fair opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of where they live or the circumstances we were born into. And that the choices we make depend on the opportunities we have, things like access to healthy foods or a quality education, 
or living in safe and affordable housing in crime-free neighborhoods. However, not everyone has these opportunities. But communities have the power to change this. Um, so this is going to be our first opportunity for you as audience members to engage with us and we want we want to encourage everybody to use the chat box and when you chat in um, please select share with all attendees so that everybody can see what you're sharing and what we want to do is ask you to think about your own community um, and share with us you know who doesn't have the same opportunities for health um, what are some of the barriers that have been been put in place and then also share what will it take to remove them and change opportunities in your community. So just a couple of questions. Um, and we'd love to hear from you and looking forward to seeing those responses in the chat box. So now that I've talked about the why, improving health outcomes and increasing health equity, um, I want to share this image with you, which is the rankings model. And it helps explain what drives health in a community. It shows the relationship between policies and programs, health factors, those light blue boxes in the middle, and health outcomes, those green boxes at the top. And when we say health outcomes, we're talking about length of life and quality of life. It shows us that all these factors impact how, how well and how long we live. So let's uh, walk through this by using an example. So expanding early childhood education improves academic achievement. This results in higher graduation rates, higher levels of education lead to higher levels of income, which make it easier to access healthy foods, clinical care, and quality housing, which in turn influence health outcomes. So again, policy is at the foundation of the model. This means that in order for everyone to have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy, we must, we must redress policies that have caused health inequities. Uh, th this is easier said than done. So creating change in community requires thoughtful and intentional planning. And now let's take a look at how County Health Rankings and Roadmaps supports communities in leading that change. Um, so I'm going to start by guiding your eyes up to the tagline in our logo. Um, and ha have you ever noticed that before? It says, we seek to build a culture of health county by county. And to do this, we support communities in a number of ways. We provide da data to guide decision making. We offer evidence of policies, programs, and strategies that work. We offer guidance to communities by connecting you with opportunities to learn with and from one another. We also work to gather and share stories of communities around the country that are at different points on this journey to, ser to serve as examples and inspiration for you and your partners. And the 24-1 communi community um, is a great example of how we are bringing um, folks together to learn with and from one another through example. So as we get started, this is going to be a second opportunity to hear from you. Um, we want to hear where do you find the need for support in working on early childhood education. And I'm going to ask Tony to launch a brief poll. Uh, this poll is multiple choice, so you can share uh, more than one answer. And I'm just looking to see. Yep, so Tony has launched the poll and we'd uh, look for folks to join in and share where you feel you need the most support for working on early childhood education in your community. There's a lot of voting going on. Keep going, everybody. A few more, few more seconds here and I'll get your votes in. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. Thank you. Get your last vote in if you want to vote. All right. So it looks like um, there's a lot of interest in seeing policies, programs, or strategies and tools to guide the journey. But people do appreciate um, data and examples from other communities, but that's wonderful. Thank you so much for voting and we appreciate your sharing.
All right. Um, thanks, Tony. So now we're going to. So if you think back, um, so how the how we support communities, one of those that I mentioned was lifting up examples. And so going to start, um, Tina and Mike are going to go into much more detail, especially around the five by five, age five initiative within the 24 one community. But we wanted to share a couple of other pieces of the community story. Um, across the 24 one, they are strengthening partnerships and collaboration to take back take action on the many factors that influence health. They're working on economic growth by investing in access to food, financial institutions and housing to create a vibrant walkable downtown. They're engaging leaders, um, thinking about how to foster collaborative leadership across the community. They're writing schools, working side by side with parents, community members, and educators to regain accreditation. They're focused on affordable housing, building wealth and neighborhoods. And finally, they're focused on early childhood, creating a quality start for children. Um, and the community's hard work is making a difference. And um, we'd encourage you to learn more about the the work that they're doing by visiting their story um, and that link is included in the resource guide so take a look at uh, the 24 one community's journey um, and as i said we'll hear more from mike and tina a little bit later on about the five by five age five initiative so pivoting from examples we did want to spend just a quick second talking about um, some of the data and how you might think about looking at data connected to education um, and we always encourage you to see where data leads you. And with the 2018 rankings released just last month, each state report included data for high school graduation rates by place, race, and ethnicity. Um, and this, so the image you're seeing here comes from the Missouri state report, but you would find a similar image in your state report, which you can access at countyhealthrankings.org. So where's the data leading us here? What this visual shows us is that black youth have the worst high school graduation rates in Missouri. And we also know that improving education outcomes is one of the best strategies to advance health equity. Investing in early childhood educa education increases graduation rates. As you listen to your guest story in a, few, in a few minutes, I'd encourage you to consider how their decisions to invest in early childhood edu education can result in higher graduation rates while improving health equity at the same time in their community. I'd also encourage you to take, to take a look at your state report to see where the data is leading you to make decisions regarding health equity. So next, we wanted to lift up our evidence resource, What Works for Health, and this is a tool that will help you find strategies, and by strategies, uh, we're referencing policies and programs, systems, and environmental changes that are a good fit for your community's priorities. A link for our What Works for Health tool is included in the list of resources. And so we wanted to um, share this resource by taking a look at a strategy that the Collective Impact Network implemented in the Normandy School Collaborative, Parents as Teachers. Um, so the strategy that we're gonna take a look at is Parents as Teachers. And within What Works for Health, you can find this strategy by searching either for Parents as Teachers in the, the search box, or you can click on Education and parents as teachers would be included in that list. So wanted to start by saying that uh, within What Works for Health, there are more than 400 strategies. Uh, it's a living database that is continually updated. And each one of those strategies contains a menu of ideas. And so again, we're seeing um, a sample screenshot of the top part of parents as teachers, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what you can find within each strategy. Um, first, you'll find an evidence rating, and that's the thermometer on the top left-hand side of your screen, which conveys the likelihood strategies will work based on best available evidence. It's core to what we do within What Works for Health and how this resource can be useful to you. It indicates which strategies have been shown to work, those that might work, and those shown not to work or to cause harm. Next, you'll see a, search, a short literature summary that highlights who a strategy can benefit, what it can do, and as we have it, information to help about cost. Um, you'll also see, and this is not included on this screen, um, each strategy includes a disparity rating to help communities use an equity lens as they explore strategies and implementation resources to move from idea to action, including an evidence rating. 
including an evidence rating, expected beneficial outcomes, summary of the evidence of effectiveness, and implementation examples. Uh, so I wanted to just talk for a quick minute about the evidence rating for parents as teachers, uh, which is rated some evidence, and that means it will likely work, but further research is needed to confirm effects. These strategies have been tested more than once and have resulted in a positive trend overall. And then I uh, wanted to just touch on the expected beneficial outcomes for this strategy, which are improved cognitive skills, increased school readiness, and improved child development. So these next two slides really touch on uh, how you can connect to uh, the guidance that's available to support your community's efforts to increase health, out health outcomes and health equity. This is, the action this is a screenshot of the Action Center, which you can find under Take Action to Improve Health on our website. And here's where you'll find step-by-step -step guidance linked to those different steps you see outlined on the screen. Uh, and it will connect you to tools and resources to move with data to action. And one way to think about the Action Center is that it really answers the question, how can we take action? Within each step, uh, it's broken down into key activities with guidance and suggested tools to support your work. Uh, think of the Action Center as a destination. Uh, when you get there, take a look at the steps to move your community forward. Um, one way, you know, so maybe think about asking questions, uh, where do you see your efforts? Um, perhaps you're, you're in a stage where you're assessing needs or resources, or you're choosing effective policies and programs. Take some time to explore the key activities and suge suggested tools available to guide your progress. So moving from tools and resources, it's equally important um, to think about who you work with um, and who you partner with and what role you play in community. And so uh, think about the partner center as answering the question, who should we work with? Um, who makes positive change happen in your community? Um, sometimes we call them leaders, change makers, or stakeholders. And whatever you call these folks, uh, they're the people who we want to partner with. So then the partner, can, the partner center can then help you think about, okay, so we've thought about the who, now how do we wanna reach them? Um, and you might start by doing some research to find out what their goals are and how they might align with yours. Then think about what's, it, what's in it for them and find a way to get connected and begin to cultivate a relationship. So we'll hear about this, the 24-1 community brought together more than 30 partners to prepare children for success both today and in the future. Um, and Mike and Tina are going to share how um, that partnership has both taken time and uh, been successful in uh, leading the community in change. So that was, a, like I said, a quick introduction to uh, why and why, how, and what we do at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. Um, I'm excited now to turn it over uh, to Mike and Tina. Thanks. I'm Mike Sorth. I'm president and CEO of the Collective Impact Network. The Collective Impact Network is a nonprofit foundation that serves as a backbone agency in organizing and supporting other nonprofits that are pursuing common goals in our community-based project areas. Good afternoon. I'm Tina Mosley, and I'm the owner and director of our Daycare and Learning Center. I am also a resident of the 24-1 area. Yeah, great to hear your voices again, Tina and Mike. And um, just before we jump in here, I'm going to let the audience know we've structured uh, the flow of this section a little bit like an interview, so folks will be hearing all three of our voices as we walk through these slides. Great. So since our, our work is community focused uh, on a specific, specific community, we thought we'd share with this national audience a map to give you a sense of where we're providing our work. So we're located in the St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, specifically in North St. Louis County, just west of St. Louis County, or pardon me, of St. Louis City. And I'll be throwing out a glossary of terms since we all have our alphabet soup of acronyms that we use in our communities. Um, we wanted to make sure that we gave you a sense of, of uh, definition of some of those terms. So you'll hear us reference the 24-1. 
Um, that comes, that term comes from the 24 municipalities that make up the Normandy School District. So it's 24 individual municipalities located in St. Louis County that when together make up the, put together, they make up the geography of the school district. You'll hear us mention the Normandy Schools Collaborative. That's uh, the name that the school district is now known as. Uh, St. Louis County is the most populated county of the region. St. Louis is one of those places. There are a couple, a couple other examples around uh, the country that the city of St. Louis is not located in the county. So the county itself is a, a large entity. Um, Beyond Housing is an agency you'll hear us mention. They're a community development agency that has really been an instrumental in all of this work that we'll talk about today. Um, you'll hear us mention Five by Age Five, which is the name of our early childhood collective impact project. So uh, all of the partners, the 30 partners that were mentioned are all a part of this project known as Five by Age Five. And you'll hear us mention PAC Centers. PAC Centers are, pro the acronym is Programs Achieving Quality. And uh, it is the effort around early childhood centers um, and supporting their improvement and uh, overall enhancement of quality. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks for introducing some of the, uh, introducing and helping us get grounded in a common language to guide us through some of the slides that you and Tina will be sharing. And so a great place to start is, uh, we know that each community has unique assets and attributes. Uh, Mike, kick us off by telling us what makes the 24-1 community unique. Sure, so as I mentioned, there are 24 municipalities. So those are 24 different cities that you can see on this map that make up the Normandy School District. Uh, most of them have their own mayor, uh, council. Some of them have their own police force. So it's, a, and it's an interesting cocktail of, of communities. Um, it's important to know too that there are currently 89 municipalities in St. Louis County. And 24 of those, as I said, are part of this particular school district. So that makes Normandy geographically a large school district, but the area has experienced significant loss of employment and property values over the last 50 years. So given that Missouri schools are funded largely by property tax, you can see the dilemma that that causes. In the 24-1, 83.3% of district residents are uh, black or African American. 96% of the Normandy school district population is black. 95% of the students in the district qualify for free and reduced lunch. And about half of the children under five live in poverty. Infant mortality rates in our two main zip codes are more than double the state and national rates. Yeah, and that right there um, is some startling data um, to begin with. And on top of that, as we prepared for this webinar, you shared, you and Tina shared that the district drew national attention for conditions in some of the schools, uh, such as poor attendance, instances of violence, and lack of academic rigor in some classrooms, um, which all the sort of the, the culmination led to the district's loss of accreditation in 2012. Um, Tina, I'd be curious if you could uh, tell us how the community moved forward from this moving uh, with data to action. Of course. Today, the school district is now known as the Normandy Schools Collaborative and serves more than 3,000 students. The district was placed under state oversight and work began in collaboration with other school districts and partners. The district has worked hard with a variety of partners to address challenges outside of their control within the community. Challenges that are a result of racial inequity and poverty which are in our region. Earlier this year, the district earned provisional accreditation. The school superintendent has referred to the district as a phoenix rising from the ashes. Yeah, and I think important to underscore uh, the efforts that um, have led to that successful moment of earning provisional accreditation. Um, so part of the community-led engagement effort led to the creation of the 24-1 initiative. Um, and Mike, as you shared on your, uh, your slide with the different terms, the name 24-1, uh, which we chosen by the community, represents the 24 municipalities in the district and the desire to have one vision for successful children, engaged families, and strong community. Um, I'm wondering, Mike, can you tell us how 
five by age five fits within this initiative? Sure, as Beyond Housing led the community engagement process, um, very early on community partners and residents zeroed in on early childhood as a priority for successful children. And at that same time, media attention was being drawn towards Missouri's lax licensing standards for childcare. And uh, so it was, it was an obvious place to, to, to start their work. The group convened the nonprofits, other nonprofits working in early childhood across a variety of fields to figure out how they could align services to meet the community's needs. And these partners work together to define our prior priorities and they, they still work together to do that. The group consists of about 30 service providers who work with children ages zero to five. And they have the shared goal that, goal that children in the Normandy Schools Collaborative will show up to kindergarten ready to learn. And the partners work in five key areas related to kindergarten readiness. And those are access to quality early learning, developmental screening, and connection to services and access to healthcare services, parenting skills, and community support. So, um, if the so, you, Mike, you just outlined, uh, you know, the what five by five, five by age five hopes to accomplish. Um, and I can only imagine that a big piece of that is then working with uh, early child care businesses to enhance their capacity to, to deliver on the five by age five pillars. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the community's journey to do that enhanced capacity? Sure, so there, there's a huge need for, for child care in the community and uh, quality of uh, child care is, is even uh, more in demand. So working in partnership with an organization called United for Children, we brought the Programs Achieving Quality uh, Initiative to the 24-1. Um, the PAC centers, as we know them, the PAC program uh, provides a holistic group of services for early childhood businesses in the 24-1 footprint. And the goal of the program is to support these businesses in reaching their own quality goals. So this isn't a, a, a hard top-down push. These are, are small businesses that, that want to in, improve their product. Um, so by providing professional development opportunities for all the staff, um, direct classroom coaching, uh, investing in the centers through a facility grant, um, and then other business and development, business development and resources, um, they, can, they can achieve their own goals. So instead of creating new services or, or designing a brand new center, we worked with existing child care centers providing child care to the children in the area and help them improve their quality, thereby supporting local businesses and local workers. Great. Um, and Tina, we haven't lifted this up, but I did just want to acknowledge that um, you've been with your business, our Daycare and Learning Center, for over 20 years. So um, know that you have both breadth and depth of experience. Uh, would love to hear from you uh, what your experience was uh, being an early implementer of the PAC model. Of course. Well, the first year was very rocky, and much of the United for Children's PAC staff time was devoted to building trust with the licensed centers such as myself. We were very leery of letting strangers into our programs whose motivations didn't really seem quite clear. United for Children restructured in the second year with more staff devoted to trust, devoted to trust the program more. And the number of centers that apply to be a part of PAC grew every year. The program has grown to four levels now um, of engagement with United for Children, ranging from level one centers who are invited to professional development opportunities and can receive teaching kits throughout the year, to level three centers who can only apply for this level after demonstrating ability to meet quality improvement goals within their center. This level can apply for large facility grants for their centers to make large improvements to their buildings that will help improve their quality. For example, last year one center made electrical updates and even installed a kitchen stove and hood so they could prepare meals on site and move closer towards accreditation. There are also now four levels, level four centers 
who have applied for Missouri accreditation and have access to grants that can cover the cost of the application as well as coaching around business sustainability. And I am a part of level four at this time. Tina, I'm glad you said that because if you didn't, I was going to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to underscore the overall uh, pathway of being able to move from level one to level four because this is really a uh, a roadmap for securing resources and increasing the capacity of your staff, improving facilities, and working towards state accreditation. Um, how else did you connect children in Missouri to the benefits of the uh, of the PAC initiative? Um, you know, I should also note that linear path of the PAC centers doesn't have to be linear. Um, that's one of the great things about having the, the businesses kind of pursue their own goals is we have centers that move up and actually down those PAC levels just based on where they are and the energy they have and resources they have to put into the advancement. So uh, it's very flexible for them. But part of the another area that we are flexible is we realized that as United for Children was working with the licensed centers, um, there were there are many children that were still attending in-home daycares, uh, be that either with grandma watching them or somebody providing a more structured environment. And since they were in those home in-home daycares, we weren't touching uh, the quality for them. And um, we wanted to try to figure out a way to also uh, give them the benefits of, of the PAC program. Um, it should also be noted in Missouri, many families rely on in-home providers or relatives or various other arrangements uh, because the cost of center-based childcare averages around $6,000 annually for two children, $16,000 annually for two children. So that's, it's a high cost to bear. So we suspected a lot of the children needed the benefit of a structured program to help them be ready for kindergarten since that's our five by age five goal. And the idea was developed to provide half day care, uh, day childcare to children for free so these families or their in-home daycare provider could bring the child to the program for half a day and the child could experience a classroom setting and interact with other children in preparation for kindergarten. So this structure has the added benefit of providing in-home providers a break for a few hours and not lose their subsidy, uh, subsidy funding that they might be getting for providing childcare. So it could give them a little respite throughout the day, uh, bring the kids into a classroom setting and then take them back home. So from that, the 24-1 Early Childhood Learning Center was born. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so we're gonna pause here and again, ask folks to uh, join us by interacting via the uh, chat box. And we'd invite folks to share uh, what's going on in your community. How are um, either the organi organizations or your community investing in early childhood initiatives to, to strengthen families and communities. Um, and again, just as a reminder, when you use the chat box, share with panelists and attendees if you're comfortable with that. And here in a little while, um, we're gonna ask Tony to share some of those responses. So keep those chats coming in. Um, and now I want to turn to uh, the, the idea of partnerships, recognizing that this work uh, was the work of many. Um, and as partnerships formed and new programs emerged, how did you work across the network of child care centers to create trust? Well, as the plan for the 24-1 Early Childhood Learning Center was implemented, United for Children and 5 by Age 5 backbone staff reestablished trust with licensed child care centers such as myself to make sure they knew that the 24-1 Early Childhood Learning Center would not impact enrollment in their own centers. We put a couple of strategies in place to foster trust. The 24-1 Early Childhood Learning Center only provided half day care and no transportation and it did not enroll children who had already attended child care in one of our centers, which is also located in the 24-1 footprint within the last six months, unless, however, the center was aware and on board with the transition. And a lot of times that did happen because their program was a better fit than our program. 
the Early Childhood Learning Center program was not designed to draw its attendance from the PAC centers. More than 2,400 children live in the 24-1 area, and there are about 1,700 slots available to children in licensed child care centers in the area. Less than half of those licensed slots are in, available in level two through four PAC centers. So there is definitely a need to be filled. This need is consistent with Missouri as a whole. As you can see in the map here, discussing the unmet need with the PAC centers help restore trust. Yeah, and you know, as I understand, um, along the way, you guys focused on continuous uh, improvement and alignment of the 24-1 Early Childhood Learning Center's focus. Tell us a little bit about that continuous improvement process, Mike. Sure. So, um, like all successful collective impact efforts, then there's a need for uh, constant communication, first and foremost, um, but also a dedication among the group to continuous improvement. And uh, like any endeavor that involves more than a couple of people, you need to be flexible. And as it turned out, the attendance at the center for both morning and afternoon sessions never reached the, its maximum of, of 55 children. And often parents cited the half day setup or lack of transportation as barriers to attending. So these competing objectives we had of not wanting to step over and harm the existing PAC centers, but also wanting to provide this uh, other resource for, for children not attending those PAC centers sort of worked against itself. So those safeguards uh, kind of backfired uh, to a certain degree. So by being creative and flexible, we are able to adjust the center focus to begin an outreach effort with in-home child care providers and that allowed us to offer those children developmental screenings and offer the, the in-home providers classroom kits or coaching. Since the Early Childhood Learning Center's overall goal isn't just to get kids into the center, but to support kindergarten readiness, this outreach aligns with the goal. And it, while it's in its fairly early stages, we have had great feedback and um, we anticipate the, the center will be utilized much more fully than it was um, in its previous iteration. Great. Um, and we just wanted to acknowledge here that uh, Five by H5 has grown to include about 30 partners, all doing great things in the 24 1. Um, many of them are listed here on this slide. And Mike, and Mike and Tina have shared how they've used data to focus on a community need um, and then that how the partners work together to develop trusted partnerships. Um, I'm wondering now if we can hear a little bit more about some of the specific actions and strategies you've implemented within 5 by H5. Well, I'll share a couple of examples of how we have partnered to deliver services to children and families within the 24-1 area. The first one is going to be Delta Gamma Vision Center, which is a child care facility based um, screening service in which they come into the programs and they offer the director and parents information about where they can go for further exam and glasses after they've already provided the vision services within the facility. Delta Gamma focus on developing relationships with child care center directors which greatly improved the number of vision screenings nearly tripling from 2015 to 2017. The same is true for parents as teachers. Parents as teachers or PAT, they provide comprehensive home visiting services, parent education to families with children from prenatal through kindergarten. The Normandy PAT is run by the PAT National Center and is able to provide developmental screenings within the centers. PAT was able to more than double their screenings as well from 2015 to, ooh, excuse me, 2016. We've also had some great volunteers from Five by Age Five partners, including Ready Readers, who visit the classrooms within the centers weekly to read to our children and support literacy by giving away free books to all of the students on a monthly basis. 
Thanks, Tina. That's a great example of the mix of um, policies, programs, and services, and how um, it takes uh, interventions all along the continuum. Uh, Mike, I'm wondering if you have one or two examples that you'd like to lift up. Sure. Beginning in um, 2014, Bell Children's Services of St. Louis Arc began their embedded early education model within the PAC centers. And they provide an early learning specialist working directly with the centers uh, to screen children, make refer referrals, and develop action plans addressing identified concerns. Bell uh, works with teachers to help recognize ways to support the children in their classroom and provide training to teachers um, in, in child development. Family Forward is another partner working sort of in concert with Bell, and they provide a community therapist to the same center, centers as Bell's children um, to deliver group and individual therapy with, with children experiencing trauma. So this approach creates sort of a wraparound services that has Bell identifying uh, issues to be addressed, coming up with a plan to address them, Family Forward offering some of that therapy, also group communication, uh, um, organization has, has been provided. So many issues that a child may be experiencing will be addressed prior to their arriving at kindergarten, putting them in the best uh, position to be successful once they're in school. Another partner is Nurses for Newborns. Um, they have worked within 5 age 5 from very early on to increase the utilization of their evidence-based nursing uh, home service visits. And um, for some families, nurse home visits are augmented by the assistance of Nurses for Newborns community health workers who provide language interpretation and or enhanced cultural competency. And they bring uh, material and community resources uh, along the way too and offer peer support for the infant's caregivers. So it's through partnerships like these that we're able to impact kindergarten re readiness holistically, beginning really prenatally, um, and support families as a whole in their health and in many other ways um, to assist in, in early education and development. Yeah, again, thanks for lifting up some of those uh, policies, programs, and systems changes that are going on within the 24-1 community. Um, and it sounds like, and you know, I've learned along the way that you guys have had a lot of success working with partners to develop um, the continuum of support. And I'm wondering if you now you might be willing to share some of your challenges. Well, <clears throat> to be honest, there's still a lot of uphill battle in supporting families in Missouri, especially low income families. Some members of the legislature has differing opinions as to how children should be cared for before they go to kindergarten. So policy efforts around child care are often limited to keeping up with the federal child care and development block grant requirements. Missouri is one of only eight states without a framework for assessing quality of child care centers and prior to 2016 was the only state that banned quality assessment. Not only is this a challenge for parents who must rely on word of mouth or platforms like Yelp to learn about child care centers, it is also a challenge for the state. Missouri is unable to compete for federal early learning grants most recently missing out on a $75 million opportunity, according to Kids Win Missouri. In addition, childcare subsidies are a challenge for both families and providers. The eligibility for childcare assistance is far below the national average and most neighboring states, as shown here on the maps. In St. Louis County, subsidy reimbursement rates or the amount providers receive for caring for children eligible for child care assistance is ranked last in the nation. I know we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for sharing what you're doing, how you're doing it, and the challenges you face. Um, and wanted to just spend a one, one slide or so thinking about, you know, if a community was interested in getting started on an early childhood readiness initiative, wh what would you all recommend? 
So uh, as Tina outlined, and, and I know this is the case in many other places around the country, there are challenges both at the local level and statewide to address, uh, that, that must be addressed if we're really gonna move the needle on readiness. But we firmly believe that by convening the right partners to meet the community's needs and getting, having a community voice at the table as well, that we can de uh, develop collaborative systems to, make, to bring the largest impact to the community. And I think that's the case in other communities too. The major takeaways that you might learn from our work are uh, pretty consistent probably with what you've heard from other collaborative efforts, you know, start small, start with a small pilot before pouring large amounts of, of funding into one particular program agency or model. Uh, the PAC program overestimated what it could accomplish in the first year and so we learned a lot about the community's needs um, both through PAC and through the Early Childhood Learning Center and then we're able, as we mentioned, we're able to adjust um, and since we began with a one moderately sized center, it wasn't like we had a large ship to turn. We could, we could uh, move pretty quickly to serve communities' needs and and tweak the program um, as we've encountered challenges with en enrollment. And the center's also been able to restructure programming uh, to still impact children. So it wasn't like we had to throw away a program. Uh, we were able, as I said, to just sort of tweak it. And the second seems obvious but relationship building, both with community members and amongst the partners you want to be involved in, has been crucial. Community members need to know that you care about the community and your efforts are genuine. And partners need to be kept engaged and informed so they stay excite excited about the work as well. Another point that's uh, key, um, obviously funding always comes into the equation at some point. And we've been very fortunate that the backbone work and the work of a handful of the partners that are a part of the Five Bay Five, Age Five initiative has largely been funded by one single private family foundation. And this kind of consistent funding source isn't something you just stumble upon. So seeking diversified funding that matches your initiative strategic plan is key. Also, uh, the patient, a patient funder, obviously, that is willing to be flexible and, and learn with you is, is uh, very helpful. And, um, but at the same time, while we're being flexible, we had to avoid mission drift or chasing money and stay focused on the real goals at hand and stay focused on kindergarten readiness. To that end, there are a number of existing early childhood initiati initiatives throughout our country. In our early planning stages, we use models like these as guides for our collective impact work. But partners chose to start a new initiative rather than join on as a partner or affiliate with other national networks. However, something might already be happening right in your own community, or it may make sense for your initiatives to partner with larger networks. Check out the landscape of your community and figure out what works for you. Thanks, Mike and Tina. I really appreciate that, sharing some of those insights and reflections. Um, I'm wondering, Tony, a few slides back, we asked the audience to share a little bit about what they're doing within their communities. Um, anything that you'd like to lift up and share with the entire audience? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate everybody for doing such incredible sharing. Not only are you sharing broadly, but you're kind of reacting to each other. So that's been very interactive. So fun. So what we heard when it came to investing in early childhood um, education um, was several folks are forming collaboratives and they're various collaboratives like with health healthcare organizations, Head Start programs, home visiting programs, daycare centers, and really kind of getting everybody on the same page in terms of um, direction and where they're going and setting goals. Um, one local health department uh, works directly with the schools and offers free services to uninsured or low-income families. Um, we saw one university um, is um, going to incubate uh, an early childhood learning center um, and using the school district as a partner and other organizations as partners. And um, 
there's also some folks are providing financial res uh, resources or academic support to early childhood professionals who are returning to school to earn their associate's degree or other degrees. So a lot of really interesting stuff. Thanks for thanks for asking. Yeah, and, um, and we'll share this opportunity in more more detail in a couple of slides, but I just want to mention that we will have a uh, discussion group next week on this topic. So if folks are interested in digging deeper into some of what Tony shared, um, we'd encourage folks to join. Also, uh, on this next slide, we're going to jump into some questions, but wanted to highlight that Tony is going to be chatting out the uh, a feedback survey, survey link. We always like to know, um, fr hear from you um, and receive your feedback, so be sure you take a second and uh, complete that uh, survey when you see the link come up in your chat box. Tony, I know I'm asking you to multitask a little bit here, chatting out a link um, and share questions that came in from our audience. Um, does one come to mind to kick off the conversation? Sure, there's lots of questions and the survey link is already up there, folks. So grab a hold of that. We really appreciate input. Um, so we, um, we have a lot of good questions. So thanks for, thanks for asking, Allie. Um, uh, but I'm gonna, give this one to Mike, I think. Mike, could you tell us a little bit about how the agencies are sharing data? There were a lot of questions around that. Sure, um, I'll give you a, a couple of ways we, we communicate and share data, but I can also say if, if this doesn't satisfy whoever asked the question or if others have uh, subsequent thoughts, they can feel free to contact me. Um, I am more than happy to communicate directly with folks. Uh, so we, we share data in a couple of different ways. There's sort of formal and informal ways. On the informal side, uh, we have a couple of subcommittees of 5 age 5 that one that focuses on sort of behavioral health development, one that's more of an academic development uh, group. They meet monthly and they may have anywhere from, oh, probably have about 15 members or member organizations and anywhere from, you know, half a dozen to all 15 may show up on any uh, given month. Um, and they, they have a, an action plan that they've put together and they're pursuing it with our support. Again, as a backboard agency, we sort of staff these efforts. Um, so they are pursuing their, their goals and they share scale data annually. They, um, they have, uh, in our, we have a quarterly meeting as well where all 30 party, uh, partners are invited and we'll have different speakers there. Um, sometimes speakers from within the group that are sharing their, their results. Um, and then we're about seven years into this effort, so it's, it's time to maybe do a little broader um, collection of data. So Beyond Housing is leading uh, this year another community-focused um, engagement effort to gather information about the community and how their needs are, are going. Um, and then the, the Collective Impact Network is doing a gathering of what we're calling the community vital signs and one area, one specific area of those vital signs is focused on early ch childhood development and then also uh, more broadly education. And so we'll be compiling those throughout the year and then those will impact our future goals as we move forward. Again, our umbrella goal of 5 by age 5 will always be preparing children for kindergarten, but looking to see how we are doing specifically um, will come out of this uh, gathering of vital signs. Great, thanks so much. Um, there was kind of a, a connected question to that question, which is, you mentioned you collect this data with your, all your partners. What if? What about the groups that are really not directly involved with you? Have you been doing any outreach and collecting data from them as well? Um, at this point, we're not really going outside of, of the, the partners, but um, this convening that we'll, we're working towards um, probably in the fall. So once we gather our, our vital signs, we'll bring in our partners and we'll bring in others that are working in the 24-1 community that may not have been a part of the group. And we'll sort of reorganize and, and hopefully bring new partners in into the fold as well and allow them to have a voice and, and also uh, see the data we've collected and share any that they've collected. Can you just really give us some idea of um, key measures that you're using um, and maybe like what tools you use to do that measurement? Uh, sure. Um, United for Children, who again, you'll recall again with our alphabet soup of uh, players here, of our cast, uh, U for C, 
they use a tool called the Environmental Rating Scales. So ERS, again, because we have to have acronyms, um, is an assessment for early childhood and school age programs that focus a lot on classroom quality. And there's several, several, seven areas um, that are measured in classroom quality. It's things such as space and furnishing, um, personal care routine, listening and talking activities, um, parents and staff uh, interaction, um, program structure, I think that's all of them. Uh, and U4C uses the results as they sort of go in and, and apply this scale and in a sense grade the classroom. They use the results of the ERS to make ad adjustments, improvements in, in, in their coaching practices and recommendations to the centers. So that then becomes sort of a benchmark and you can see as as centers are moving through the PAC program, sort of as we said, it doesn't have to be linear, but sometimes it is kind of going from uh, center uh, uh, level two center to three um, you'll we'll look back on that benchmark and see how they're they're moving forward and it's a great tool for for you for C to to modify um, their interventions or their assistance uh, to the centers um, then Bell Children's Services of St. Louis Arc uses the ages and stages questionnaire and then also the ages and stages questionnaire social emotional which is known as ASQ or ASQSE. Again, we have to have more acronyms. Uh, and it measures, these tools measure children's attainment of developmental milestones. And, and we apply that in the, the PAC centers. So again, just like we had the, the uh, last one uh, to look at the center, this is looking at how children are developing within the center. And then Bell and the other partners are able to use uh, the results of those screenings to come up with the, the best uh, uh, additional interventions or overall program tweaks that they may need to make. That's great. I really appreciate that detail um, and myself. Uh, I hope that was helpful to the folks that are there's lots of questions around outcomes. And this one could be for Mike or Tina. Actually, Tony, so, this, oh, I'm actually going to jump in, Tony. This is oh, Allie. Yeah. And we're okay. really close to time. And I want to honor our audience. Sure. Um, I'm sorry. Thanks. Commitment. Yeah. So um, we do have more questions. And like I said, we'll um, probably answer some of those offline. But also, um, do have an opportunity to keep the conversation going next week. Um, join us for a discussion group from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And um, this is a facilitated interactive discussion uh, where you can share what you're doing locally as well as ask keep these questions coming of other participants. And we're able to offer these um, discussion discussion groups um, in partnership with Active Living by Design. Joanne Lee, um, who's with Active Living by Design is our lead facilitator. Uh, we encourage folks to join by video conference so that we can meet face to face um, and build out our networks. The, it is limited capacity, so sign up early. And I believe that the registration link is being shared out and will also be included as follow up to today's webinar. And just as we close out, uh, always like to encourage folks to stay connected with us on the various social media platforms. And we do have a next webinar scheduled. So if uh, you're interested in hearing more about um, going all in to improve health through multi-sector collaboration and systematic data sharing, join us on May 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And with that, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to our guests for sharing their story. And uh, thank you for the team behind behind uh, the scenes that made today's webinar a success. Have a great afternoon, everyone.